Awesome. Before we take a seat, we are going to read some scripture together. Um, and uh, we're continuing our study of the gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter four, Luke chapter four, starting in verse one. And uh, just out of reverence, we're going to stay standing for this time. And uh, out of reverence, out of a eagerness to receive, and then a willingness to take and share this. That's what we're gonna do. So this is uh, the gospel of Luke chapter four, starting in verse one. That's what God's word has for us tonight. It says, then Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God, serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. And after the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Breakaway, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a seat. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. Well, howdy. howdy. Here's my dynamite intro. Prayed about this one for a long time. First words to come out of my mouth. Ready? It's hot outside. It's hot outside. Oh boy. Uh, a strange, non-revelatory thing to lead with, correct? Here's the reason I lead with it. Some of you appear to not be aware that it is hot outside. True story, true story. Uh, I was coming to the arena tonight, a couple hours early, and there was nobody else around. And there was one college student, one college student. I will divulge that she was female. Not because it's only females that have this issue right now. It's just, that's what happened, okay? Uh, she was wearing shorts, sneakers, and a lovely Texas A&M Aggies sweatshirt, okay? Right, so I know you're whooping the Aggies thing. Don't be whooping. It was 103 degrees outside. We were hundreds of yards from the nearest academic building. I know it gets cold in the buildings in Texas. We overcompensate with the air conditioning in this state like we need to. Uh, I was just legit worried. So we're gonna pause and pray for whoever you were. If you're in <laughs> the arena tonight, <laughs> may the spirit come upon you. Open your eyes. Uh, it's hot. Uh, I've done the research. In fact, uh, although it feels like Texas is the hottest place ever recorded, it is in fact not. Did you know that the hottest air temperature ever recorded in the world was in the United States. Uh, shockingly, it was not College Station. Uh, it was in a place called Death Valley, California. 134 degrees, 30 degrees hotter than my sister was enduring uh, walking outside today. So uh, why is it called Death Valley? This is really interesting. It's actually not because of the heat. It's really interesting. Uh, 1849, this is in the height of westward expansion and cattle drives and wagon trails and, and all of that. 
uh, and there was a company that had sponsored a particular wagon to make it across the Rockies into California, into you know, their promised land, if you will. 1849, the trail leader's name in this particular voyage is Jefferson Hunt. And he is a known guide. He's well known, he knows what he's doing, he knows the way. But in this particular travel party, the pivotal thing in the article I read about this was the following sentence. The people following Hunt grew impatient with his pace and his preferred route. Remember those words, his pace and his preferred route. And there's this murmur that grows among the travel party as they kind of cross other travel parties in different directions every couple weeks on the trail. And the murmur is, there's a shortcut. There's a shortcut that can save us weeks and get us to our destination even faster. And Hunt is saying, no, listen to me. We need to stay. We need to go slow. We need to stick to my route, stick to my wisdom. And that is not what they do. The followers of Hunt Some of them stay with Hunt. And then there are about two other groups that splinter out and go across this valley. At first, the travel is easy and light. They get a couple days into this valley and they realize they've made a horrible mistake. Uh, There's no fresh water. The water they do find is very salty and not drinkable. Uh, Exposure, dehydration, and people start passing away. The party shrinks in size. It's mostly women and children who actually make it. They eventually meet back up with Hunt, who's been on the other side of this treacherous journey for quite some time. Their shortcut took four months. Their shortcut took four months. And as one of those survivors was getting out of that place of death, he'd look back according to legend and said, farewell, Death Valley. Now, my friends, the story of Jesus that we just read takes us into conversations about temptation tonight. And temptation is not so different from that valley. And I think the point that I'm trying to make before we dive into the scriptures is that it is not the heat of temptation that proves lethal. It's the lie within it. Heat did not kill the people in that story. Lies did. Trusting the wrong voices did. Not sticking to the pace and the preferred route of the one with the knowledge, the one who's proven is what killed the people on that journey. And my friends, us on our journey, it's no different. As we go through the scriptures today, my friends, as we go through the scriptures, we're gonna track what Jesus experiences in this story. And I say story, it's, it's, that's what it is. It's a story, but just to be very clear, this is no parable, all right? This is no parable. Luke is very obvious when he's telling a parable or whether something metaphorical or poetic, the form of the narrative has not shifted at all. This is presented as a historic event. And as we go through, we're gonna take note of three temptations that reveal three lies Because remember, the temptation's bad, but it's the lie within it that really gets you. And then three truths that Jesus combats those with. Now, that sounds really clean. That sounds like I've just given you a pretty clear roadmap for what we're gonna do, right? And it is gonna be somewhat straightforward that way, but I, I gotta give you a warning. It's not just because I might have undiagnosed ADD that we're gonna wander a little bit. Uh, We're gonna stick to those three primary lies, but there's gonna be different things to highlight because here's the thing, you have a real enemy and he's crafty, he's crafty. His playbook is not just, here's my three things, right? Here's my three things. And then I know that they have the three verses that will combat those three things. So I'm just locked up now. Satan's a little more crafty than that. So we're gonna have to wander. So, you know, keep your thinking caps on. He's crafty, his deceptions can be sophisticated, multi-layers, but listen, even though we wander as we try to understand our enemy, but not nearly as much as we try to understand our savior who's beaten our enemy, uh, it's all gonna get shrunk down to this realization. Your enemy's crafty, but for all of eternity, he's basically been using the same few lies. I will call them out now instead of keeping you in suspense. The lies sound something like this. He doesn't love you. Your father doesn't love you. Your, your father's not a good dad. Your father's not a good dad. You can't trust him. He's holding out on you. In fact, you 
should call the shots. That was the lies that we saw in Genesis 1 with Adam. And those are the lies that have been woven into every human, every person trying to follow Yahweh, trying to follow Jesus, trying to follow the God of Bible. Every sin that's ever been commit came in the wake of believing those kind of lies. So let's see, what does Jesus have for us? Let's take a walk. Let's see how Jesus establishes himself as the son. That's the big thing we got to take into the text. To catch you up, the gospel of Luke has a great introduction that goes all the way through verse uh, chapter, uh, the end of chapter two. And these last couple of weeks, we have seen different things proclaiming Jesus to be the son of God. Okay, uh, John the Baptist, the forerunner comes and declares he's coming. The son of God we've been waiting for is coming. And then the voice of God himself audibly declares, this is my son. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then last week we went through a genealogy of 77 names. We did it y'all, well done if you were here, we did it. And that genealogy, that pedigree, that lineage all proclaimed together son, pointing at Jesus, he's the son of God. And so now we're gonna see Jesus further established in that identity by his father, but that identity is about to get attacked by the enemy of our soul. Let's see what the verses do for us. Starting in verse three, let's just walk through this. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Right off the bat, if, where God has just spoken certainty, the enemy is trying to make doubt. If you are, if you are, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. There's this backhanded attack on his sonship. If you are, are you really his son? So look at the strategy of the enemy. Can I get him to doubt who he is? Can I get him to doubt who he is? And parenthetically, if I can get him to doubt that his father is good, maybe I can get him to doubt that he's a good father, he's the father at all. And maybe I can get him to doubt his sonship. And maybe I can get him to divert even a little bit from his master plan, which is to destroy me by dying for the sins of the world on the cross. He's trying to do everything he can to get Jesus off his mission to recover the children that were lost all those years ago in Genesis three. So right off the bat, it's, he's basically saying, prove it. That's the spirit of the three temptations. It's like, okay, the father has just declared that you're the son, the genealogy and the gospel of Luke has declared that you're the son. Satan steps into this space. Okay, prove it, prove it. And, and the whole thing is supposed to be, I don't have to prove it. Like your, your voice is irrelevant. That's supposed to be the thing. But when identity gets proclaimed over a person and received, Satan is quick to go in and try to create immediate doubt. And one of the ways he could do that is trying to get you to prove what God and your father have already proclaimed. Don't let your enemy get you caught up in trying to prove what the father has already proclaimed over you. Notice he says, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased before Jesus does anything. The same thing is true for you if your faith is in Christ. Okay, your sonship, your daughterhood has nothing to do with you proving it for that to be true. He's proclaimed it over you. Don't go trying to earn what you've been freely given. Amen? Amen. So lie number one is simply this. Your father doesn't provide for you. Do it yourself. Your father doesn't provide for you. Do it yourself. Uh, the fundamental element of a father-child relationship is, or is at least supposed to be by design, provision. A father, a loving father provides for his child, for his children. And I'll pause here for a moment and say, if that was not the case for you, I'm so, so sorry. I see you, we see you, God sees you. And the great news is we know a father <laughs> who will provide for you in ways that you've not experienced before. May that come to bear on your heart tonight. So can I get him to doubt God's provision or at least doubt God's timing? That's what Satan is thinking in this moment. Can I get him to doubt God's provision or at least 
God's timing? Can I get him to prove it? There's these different evil schemes all interweaving in this first temptation. But that patience concept is immediately present. That same patience concept that was teed up in Death Valley is now present here. It'll be present in all three temptations. Can I get, can I get Jesus to do now what God has a perfect plan for later? So understand that, start connecting the dots about how that's going to be applied to your life. Can I get him to turn God's not quite yet into his right now? Because that's getting to the root of most temptations you face in your life, isn't it? Isn't it? Trying to turn God's not yet into your right now, but Jesus doesn't take it. Verse four, Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. He puts this truth out there. My father, he always provides what I need in his perfect timing. And he's quoting Deuteronomy six in all three of these temptations, in all three of his truth claims. He's going back to Deuteronomy. He's going back to God's law, God's second law for his people. He's subjecting himself to the same kind of standards of obedience. He's emptying out his divinity. He's gonna play by the rules of every person in this room so that when it comes to our temptations, he can relate to us that you'll never be able to say, you don't know how to relate to me in my temptation, Jesus. And he can say, no, 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 I absolutely can. I, 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 I held myself to the same standard that you were held to. I had no resources in my temptation that you did not have access to through the Holy Spirit that dwells in you if your faith is in him. He always provides what I need in perfect timing is the truth he counters with. Let's keep cruising, verse five to seven. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. So <laughs> this is hilarious. It's like the devil had like strike one, like didn't even put the bat on the ball in the first temptation. And now he's swinging for the fence even harder, right? He's like, well, I offered you bread last time. How about I give you all the power in the world, right? He's taken that up a level and he's just gone for it. Before it was just, can I kind of come in the back door through a cracked window and get him to jump the plan of God and timing and lay down his patience and take control of the narrative, all of that. Now he's like, worship me, right? This is a desperate enemy doing whatever he needs to do. Intentional, but he'll swing hard if he needs to, all right? So the heart of this temptation, listen to me, is what, this, what Satan is trying to do in the life of Christ for the entirety of the gospel of Luke. He's trying to get Jesus to sidestep the cross. He's trying to get Jesus to choose Glory without suffering. He's trying to give him all the authority that he will get, that he has now, but he's trying to do whatever he can to, to try to blow up this whole cross plan because he knows that's where he meets his end. He knows that. And so he's trying to say, can I get him to choose the glory of the reward without the suffering of the cross? He wants Jesus to abandon his mission to be the sinless sacrifice that you and I need for our forgiveness. And what a, what a bold ask, a blatant ask for idolatrous worship, but it's an offer of power. So lie number two is simply this, your father doesn't share power with you, but I will, but I will. And the lies from the offer of lies are all over the place. He has been given a measure of authority. Uh, he's been given the ability to operate in this world with very powerful abilities to bring real harm into the lives of saints like you and me, but he is exaggerating what he is capable of doing like crazy. And he will lie like crazy to get Jesus to make a misstep. And he will offer you anything you say you want, whether he can back it up or not, because he'll throw down lies at any time to trip you up and to trip up Jesus. Your father doesn't share power with you, but I do again. Jesus will have all power, period. He will have all authority. We will see that play out, but it's a lie here thrown at him. Verse eight, how does Jesus respond? 
Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I love his response here. Again, quoting Deuteronomy, but he, he's pointing to this really glorious truth, y'all. It's simply this, every temptation to sin is really an attempt to get you to stop worshiping God and start worshiping your enemy or yourself, which really have the same effect. And Jesus in this moment is saying, nah, no, nah, we're not doing this. It's not about God, the father bow, bowing to my desires and my needs of when he's gonna share authority and power with me. I trust him, I serve him. That's the truth. I worship and I serve him, not vice versa, period. In this place of temptation, he responds with a, pro with a proclamation of praise. May we do the same. Keep cruising, verse nine through 11. The final attempt from the enemy, right? So he took him to Jerusalem. And I love the pace. Jesus will get to Jerusalem in about three years. Satan's trying to speed this thing up as much as he can. Takes him to Jerusalem, has him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, the temple complex. Y'all, this is high. He's on a corner of the temple pro uh, complex. Um, very, very large fall. Church history, church tradition says that James the Just was actually thrown off this very place as his martyrdom. That's the place he's taken. And he says to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Again, let's not miss this. If you are the son of God, another attack on sonship, right? Another attack on sonship. This is Satan, again, twisting scripture, which he'll happily do in the life of Christ and in your life. Did God really say dot, dot, dot? It's the same spirit. Now, what I don't want us to miss to understand the nature of this temptation is the public nature of the temple. The temple is the center of Jewish life. It is uh, not just the center of spiritual life outside the temple was a marketplace. So this is a highly visible place. So what is being proposed by Satan here is, hey, if you're really the son of God, you really have the power you say that he's gonna give you, you know, in my second temptation, you mentioned that. Uh, listen, here's my idea. Here's my proposal. Why don't you throw yourself down from here in front of all these people doing their shopping or doing their worshiping or doing their socializing. And it says in the book that the angels are gonna come and they're gonna swoop in and keep you from being harmed. And you're gonna reveal yourself as the son of God by spectacle instead of by suffering. That's the heart. So it's a new temptation, but it's tapping into the same overarching strategy that the enemy has. Sidestep the cross, reveal yourself this way in public, make a spectacle. Don't do the meek thing and don't do the go find the outcasts thing and don't do the three year build up thing and don't do the intentional advance and retreat with you know, a master plan in mind and don't follow these footsteps that the, that the God of the universe has prepared for you to get to the cross. Just do it now, just do it now with a spectacle instead of suffering. But what I love it underneath that not what I love, but I love that we can see it and reveal it. Somewhere in that temptation is him trying to plant a lie about his father to further attack the sonship. And the lie is your father doesn't protect you. Your father doesn't protect you. If so, prove he does. Prove it. Act like someone who's not quite sure that the father protects the son. Prove it. It's more of this spirit of prove what's already been proclaimed. Allow doubt to creep in enough so that you prove to me and maybe to yourself that what he's proclaimed over you is not true. This is the heart of the strategy of the enemy against Jesus. And as we start to work towards application, my friends, that is something that he's going to try to do to get you to prove things that the father has already proclaimed over you. That's lie number three. And look at verse 12. Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. What's the truth that he counters with? 
I do not need to test him if I already trust him. I do not need to test him if I already trust him. Beautiful. Again, all three temptations, he responds with Deuteronomy. He responds with the scriptures to bring truth to the lies. Last verse, 13. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Like for a time. What does that mean? Like, well, he's gonna show up again. When does he show up again? The garden of Gethsemane. The last few hours of Jesus's life is when Satan will swoop back into the story according to the way it's told by Luke, will do his final best to bring so much crushing anxiety onto the shoulders of the son of God that he will not walk the last few yards of the marathon. And my friends, can I just do the spoiler? Jesus wins, okay? You can cheer for that, Jesus wins. He does, he will not be deterred. He won't be deterred. He'll, he'll see that through. And what's so incredible, you know how he says, bring the angels. If you're the son of God, bring the angels. That next time in the final chapters of Luke, the angels show up and they minister to Jesus. And they basically, in invisible fashion, carry him through those final, those final hours. He finishes living the perfect life we could never live. He dies the death that we should have died for our sins. He does it in our place because he loves us for our forgiveness. And then he'll rise to new life. And that ultimate validation, this is the son of God, is that resurrection. We'll get there, but it's already hovering in the words here. It's already hovering. So that's the story, three temptations with three lies underneath them, with three truths straight from scripture to deflect those lies. But what are the few things we need to focus on right now to make sure we don't miss the main point and to help us respond well, right? Just a couple more notes to take. First of all, please don't miss this. In the big picture of the story of God, I'm gonna keep doing this every week, not just so that we get good at Luke, but so that we see Luke is a way to roll out the entire biblical story and understand what God is doing in scripture. Listen to me, in Genesis three, we talked about this last week, Adam, first representative of humanity, fails in a place of temptation with the enemy. That's how sin enters the world. Then you go through further into the story of humanity, trying to get back to the Garden of Eden in many ways. And then Hosea 11, one and two, uh, it's God referring to the people of Israel as his child. And he calls them out of slavery and he brings them into the wilderness and they sin, they fail. So we've got Adam failing, we've got Israel failing. Listen to me, then comes Jesus the perfect son of God, Adam, son of God, not perfect. Israel as God's child, God's son in many metaphorical ways, not perfect, right? Jesus comes, the perfect son of God. He comes quoting Deuteronomy, the same law God's people couldn't keep. And he follows and he gives total obedience in the way that all of humanity has failed to. And he's successful in the places where humanity has failed. And he walks out his journey in completion the ways that everybody else previously could not walk. Free of sin, total obedience, total submission to the plan of God for his life all the way to and through the cross. So my friends, I don't want us to miss this. I don't want us to miss that yes, Jesus gives us principles for how to fight temptation. He does that. He's like, yes, it is a very good thing to, to know scripture. It's a very good thing to know the truth of scripture and respond to lies with scripture. Of course, that's a good thing to do in temptation. And he shows us that it's good to do the pre-work. Can I tell you this? If you wanna have victory over temptation at night, fight the fight in the morning. Does that make sense? Like if you want victory over temptation that comes at night, fight the fight in the morning. Guys, he's 30, he's been studying scripture, he's been living in community, he's been praying, he's been meditating, he's been preparing his heart, he's been serving in humility, he's been doing all this preparation for his time of testing and temptation. And it says he goes into this time in the desert filled with the spirit, guided by the spirit. 
So he's full of the word. He's full of the spirit. He's full of his identity that's just been spoken over him. And I think one of the most important things you can know is that temptation doesn't deposit anything in a man or woman. It reveals what's already in there. So what's in you? It is your true identity in your mind and in your heart. Is the spirit of God who gives you strength and wisdom in the times of testing, is that within you? Is the word of God stored up in your heart and your mind? Yes. So is he giving us principles? Is he giving us footsteps to follow? Absolutely. Cling to all those things, but do not miss this. More important than following the principles that Jesus puts out is knowing where to run, my friends is knowing where to run. And this is what you gotta know, that when, it's, when temptation comes your way, run from sin, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus, the one who's already been victorious over sin for you. All right, so don't just like, when you face temptation, don't just start like rattling off Bible verses from memory. Do that as long as you're running to Jesus while you do so. Run to Jesus in the time of temptation in prayer, run to the community that Jesus has placed around you. Run to Jesus, don't just do the Jesus stuff, run to him. Many of you think you can't do that because you think he's gonna be grossed out by the fact that you were even tempted. That is not the posture of Jesus towards the tempted. He wants the tempted to come to him, to be honest with him. So we could say, well done. You have not sinned when you've been tempted. You've sinned when you've given in to the temptation and believe the lie instead of the one who is the truth. So run to Jesus is the most simple thing that I think I can tell you that is the main point of this text. Run to him, run to him. And my friends, I just, I wanna take it full circle to the beginning. When the people in Death Valley went astray, it was because, <laughs> it was because they'd had enough of the pace and the preferred route of the one who was leading. That's the same concept we see in this text. Satan is trying to get Jesus to outrun the pace that the Father has set for him in perfection. He's trying to make God's not yet, Jesus is right now compromise the whole thing, stop trusting, choose sin, all of that, right? The beautiful thing here, right? Is at first he's like, turn these stones into bread. Can I tell you that Jesus will get bread again? He will eat again. And then there'll be an overflow. A couple of years from now, he'll get so much bread, he'll feed 5,000 people and there'll be leftovers. There will be bread in perfect timing. And then it's like, hey, all the power of the kingdoms of the world, right? All the power of the kingdoms of the world, There's gonna be a time for that. Can I tell you, Jesus is reigning on high right now. And we know that all the authority on earth was given to him because in Matthew 28, that's the same authority he shares with us. Out of the overflow of his authority, he says, now you've got the authority, go and share. Go and speak about the victorious one who can give you victory over your sins, right? That's what's happening here. It's absolutely beautiful. And then that third temptation, y'all, so powerful, so powerful the divine assistance, the angels coming, not only does Jesus eventually receive that divine assistance, angels coming to minister to him in perfect timing right before the cross. He now sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me, dispatching divine resources of all kinds, angels included, to help us in our times of need and temptation. God is so good and his plan is so perfect. So listen, when you face your temptation, when you face your temptation, be willing to recognize nearly every single temptation, no matter the nature of it, is you trying to make right now what God is saying, not quite yet. Trust me, trust me, not quite yet. That pleasure, that opportunity, that next step, that relationship, not yet. Just trust me, keep, trust the plan, walk with me, keep the pace, stick with my preferred route. Don't shortcut the process. There are no shortcuts to the joy and the peace and the glory and the purpose that he has for you. He is worth trusting, my friends. So trust him, so trust him. Would you bow your heads, I wanna pray for us.